Our next speaker of the day is Warren Miller. He lives in Sydney, Australia. Uh, the Rail Enthusiast Society came into existence in December 2015, and we launched our first magazine only in August 2016. Membership was picking up very slowly, and we were trying to establish ourselves. It was therefore a very pleasant surprise when, in 2017, I received a welcome email from an Australian, Warren Miller, that he had seen our magazine at the National Rail Museum in New Delhi and was interested in joining the society. We welcomed him with open arms. And since then, Warren Miller has been one of our most active members, taking part in all our virtual events and contributing regularly for our magazine. He went out of the way to host one of our members who was visiting Australia and helped him see the heritage sites around Sydney. Warren was one of the speakers in our first conference in 2021 and helped us get a speaker for our second conference. And he is the next speaker today. He is a retired electrical engineer with a passion for the railways and its history. During his career in international standards development, he traveled widely on the railways in Australia, India, Europe, and South Africa. He lived in Sydney and has written several articles on rail travel. His hobbies include making models of Indian railway trains. In fact, he had contributed an article in our magazine on how Indians can convert, um, let's say, kits available for other railways in, to look alike for uh, loading stock of the Indian railways. I will therefore not stand between Warren Miller and his talk and hand over the stage. Warren, over to you. Oh, thank you, JL, and uh, thank you for those kind words. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, where it's applicable. Um, I think I'll start my presentation by just going straight to sharing screen and uh, slideshow. Very good. I'm going to uh, take a look at a number of rail museums in various countries, uh, not in North America, because they'll be very well covered elsewhere. But I've decided to sort of take it from the view as looking at what uh, works in a railway museum and what perhaps doesn't work as well. But in saying that, I realize now that some features of a museum may work well for some visitors, but disappoint others. So I have to admit that railway enthusiasts, of which I think I consider myself one, uh, compared to the regular public and compared to even children, will all have different expectations in a railway museum and different things will satisfy different people. But in my presentation, I'm saying it, seeing it from the view of a railway enthusiast. So I'll be looking at the strengths and weaknesses of some museums, and certainly some are excellent and some have some scope for improvement. I would emphasize that the pictures I'll be using are not up to date. They've been taken over the past 20 years and some are actually 50 years old. So if I talk about a museum and its features, it may well and truly be out of date and the museum may have changed since then, but I'm commenting on them as I found them. So to start, I'd like to look at a couple of examples of contrasts in railway museums. This is a railway museum. It looks more like a train wreck, but it is in fact a railway museum and uh, it's the best that can be achieved. However, by contrast, this also is an exhibit in a railway museum and it looks almost as if it's the train standing at the station ready to leave. So there's quite a, a range of outcomes in museum presentation. And uh, similarly, I, I hesitate to say this, but this is the interior of one of the carriages at the Delhi Museum. I'm not sure which, and perhaps that's just as well, but it obviously shows signs of neglect. It looks fine on the outside, but of course the visitors don't see what's inside it unless they sort of poke their camera up to a very dirty window. Uh, by contrast, here is a carriage of similar vintage in the Barcelona Railway Museum. It's a VIP carriage. And as you'll see, it's been very nicely presented inside to represent the way it was in service. So again, different outcomes in different museums. And just looking at locomotives, as a small child, I had a book of railways which included this picture of a derelict locomotive in Portugal. And as it says there, it was built in 1862 and is now ready for the scrap heap. 
However, thanks to a, a good museum development, you can now see that very same locomotive in pretty much as it looked when it was working in the Railway Museum in Portugal. So with a few of those contrasts, I might look at now at some museums and see how they fare. But to set the scene, I'd mentioned that railway exhibits have been in museums for many, many years, and even before railway museums as such were considered. In, uh, in Europe, during the time of industrialization, many countries developed technical museums, as they called them, just to show the latest developments in technology. And clearly, historic railway items were considered part of that and placed in technical museums. Um, the one I'm showing here is the Vienna Technical Museum, where there is a small number of locomotives dating from the middle of the 19th century on display. Now, these are a little different to a railway museum because there's no attempt to recreate the atmosphere of operation of railways. They are presented as uh, technical exhibits to be studied and examined. Although in this case, you can see there's a very nice example of some very early railway signaling, signaling beside the locomotive. But as time went on, railways developed and the railway companies themselves realized that they should set aside some of the historical rolling stock for future generations. And a good example of this is the London and Northeastern Railway in Britain. In 1925, this railway celebrated its centenary and it arranged a parade of historic locomotives. And when that was finished, they decided that a number of them should be set aside in a museum which the railway itself went on to establish at York. And this photo was taken in the original York Railway Museum, not the present day one. This was the one created by the railway itself. As you can see, it's in a fairly old small building with a timber truss roof, and the few exhibits are all crowded up very closely. It wasn't ideal as a museum, but it was a very early effort and it did ensure preservation. It was quite, quite cramped if you visited it and the exhibits were all close together. You could look at them, but it wasn't, it wouldn't measure up to today's presentation standards. And if you notice this little single wheeled locomotive, we'll, we'll see that again in a minute. One of the other historic exhibits at York was this single wheeled locomotive with the driving wheels of eight foot in diameter to give it uh, extra speed, but of course, less traction. The present day museum in York, of course, was established in the early 1970s as the British National Railway Museum, and it inherited exhibits from a number of sources. As you see, can see here, it, uh, one of it, it was based in the former York Locomotive Depot and made use of the turntable and other facilities there. In this picture, you can see one of its um, more interesting historic exhibits. It's a locomotive representing the Great Western Railway on the very broad gauge of seven foot. Now, in fact, the locomotive is not original. It's a reconstruction built in the 1980s because no seven foot gauge locomotives still existed. It wasn't built from complete, completely from new. They did use the boiler out of a small shunting engine and the frames and the rest of it were built from scratch. Uh, it, it is operated on occasions, but it doesn't get much use because there's very few museums have a length of seven foot gauge track to run it on. But to the left of this, you can see the little locomotive that was I, I showed you earlier in the original York Museum, which is now displayed in a much better area. The York Museum also had a historic exhibit in the very first Garrett locomotive that was built. It's since been moved out of York Museum and operates on the West Highland Railway in Britain. It's seen here on one of their turntables. But of course, this wasn't the Garrett that set the pattern for all future Garretts. The, the first one had a few unusual features. It was a compound locomotive, so it had both high and low pressure cylinders. And the cylinders were placed at the inside end of the power units, not at the outside. And this turned out not to be a good idea because it certainly meant that the cab got rather hot. So the next Garrett that was built set the pattern for all future Garretts. And of course, the next Garrett was built for the Darjeeling Himalayan Railway. It's a great pity that it didn't survive or it would have been a very historic artifact for the Delhi Museum. Now, moving to a different museum, um, the one that Mr. Bonazzo mentioned yesterday at Naples in Italy, the Italian National Railway Museum. 
It's a, an interesting and unusual museum and quite an impressive one. The picture here shows the suburban railway station that is right next to the museum at Pietraza. And the museum itself is set in the historic railway workshops in that town. And you can see it here. <coughs> um, <coughs> pardon me. When you enter the museum, you tend to be somewhat awestruck. It's quite impressive, in fact, almost overwhelming. Um, it's a very authentic setting for the uh, locomotives because many of these and other loco locomotives were built there during the factory's history. But I'm not sure that it makes an ideal museum. You may note on the right, there is a handrail running down in front of the exhibits, uh, which means that you can only see them by walking up and down in front of them. On the left, you can actually enter in among the exhibits. But they're all lined up very formally, and they are correctly shown in their operating colours, which are all black. So there's not a lot of distinction between them, and while a railway enthusiast may understand and appreciate their differences, the average visitor may just find that there is too much that looks similar. However, like a lot of museums, they have a working replica of their first uh, train, uh, which Mr. Benazzo mentioned yesterday. It's seen here and it is used for operation on special occasions, but it's a new replica built in the 1930s. Uh, this just gives you a general view of how a visitor would see the locomotives. Uh, on one side, you just walk up and admire them from the front, and there's a lot of them. <laughs> one thing the museum does very well is uh, organised visits for school children from various uh, levels of schooling. You can see a group here. And before I leave it, I'll just show one more photograph, which was actually an accident. My camera went off by mistake, and I thought, I'll put that picture in anyway. It shows the importance of good signposting around a museum to show where the toilets are, uh, where the emergency exits are. And also here it shows the amount of natural light that comes in through the industrial building's roof with one side gathering a fair bit of natural light. The only drawback I'd mention is when I visited the museum, I was looking forward to buying some books and postcards to read more about it and perhaps having a snack. But when I visited the museum a few years ago, there was no shop and no cafe, which I thought was unusual. I hope they've got some now. Moving on to a totally different type of museum, uh, a very professional one in the UK at Swindon. Swindon was the home of the workshops for the Great Western Railway, and the museum is dedicated to that railway and particularly to the workshops. And it's got very good access. You can virtually go anywhere among the exhibits. What you see here is a reconstructed station building and platform with the exhibits spread out around it. It pays a lot of attention to the workshops themselves because that was the main employer in the town of Swindon. It also makes very good use of mannequins that are actually very realistic uh, representations of people. These things are quite expensive, but so many museums don't go to that trouble. But in this example, it shows a locomotive being maintained during wartime when a lot of women took up jobs in the workshops. And it's been quite well done. The, this display is sort of fenced off from all of the rest of the museum. And with the museum structure in the background, it looks like a good, a good true feeling for the way it would have been. And as you can see, the locomotive smoke box and chimney have been taken off. They're sitting in the foreground, and the woman is sitting in the smoke box taking some superheater elements out. Another nice use of mannequins is this one just showing them unloading a small goods van. The figures are quite realistic, but they've also gone to the trouble of showing the porter who is on the right, leaning back as if he's hifting, lift, shifting a heavy load. It tends to, those little details tend to make the setting more convincing. On the platform, there's a uh, refreshment trolley with a lady pouring the tea out. And it's so realistic, you almost expect the tea to be coming out of the teapot at any time. Uh, it's quite a good effect. And of course, they have a figure representing the Great Western Railway's engineer, Isambard Kingdom Ronell, standing proudly in front of one of his locomotives. It's not a huge museum, but it's certainly very top class in all its quality of displays. Uh, now for something different.
um, in a less well-off country where they still had a lot of railways uh, that really underpinned the economy of the country, Zambia has a National Railway Museum in the town of Livingston. As you might imagine, it's a bit more basic than some, but the right efforts have been made. Uh, this is the entry to the museum, which is just off a fairly, uh, a fairly rustic bit of railway. As you enter the museum, you can see that most of the exhibits are outdoors of, of necessity. They have gone to the trouble of putting a covered shelter over one of their more historic timber bodied carriages. And also you'll see that there's paths and a bit of attempt to have gardens and lawns. So the presentation is, is quite good. But I do emphasize it's a museum that doesn't get money, that doesn't get much money. It has very few visitors. So obviously there's not a lot of resources available. Uh, Garrets were the primary motive power in the former state of Rhodesia and in Zimbabwe and other countries. So it has a good display of Garrets, but essentially they're just placed on tracks or br branch lines that are running off into the bush. A more modern freight locomotive is this one. It's British built, but to an American design. And this uh, allows me to show that one thing they do do properly is the signposting. They've taken the trouble to put up proper informative signs for all the exhibits. They may be hand painted, but the information is there and that's an important part of any museum. But coming back to the rather shabby train that I showed earlier on, that's in the museum and it does show the challenges with outdoor displays. As you'll see, there's rust coming through the side of the tenders, the tender, the cab roof is partly collapsing, the engine's in a fairly sorry state and worse than that, the whole thing has just been placed on rails and sleepers on unprepared ground. So that with the weight of the exhibits, they have settled unevenly and gives it a very uh, unprofessional look. However, I wish them all the best for the future. Um, moving down now to another one nearer to home for me in Queensland. It's the Ra States Railway Museum at Ipswich, which is a suburb of Brisbane and was also the location of Queensland's Railways Steam Workshops. The, the, the exhibits are mostly undercover, housed in the former workshop building, which is a very suitable setting, being a, a typical industrial building of the time, as you'll see here. The exhibit shown here is just a, a typical country mixed train with both freight and passenger accommodation, very nicely presented. One of their earliest locomotives is one that holds the, uh, the first train out of Brisbane, a small 042 locomotive built by Dubs in Britain. Uh, this is a detailed photo of the top of the engine, but my main purpose is just to show the nature of the building that it's housed in. You can see it's got all the typical uh, details there, a sawtooth roof with uh, lights, with light coming in from one angle, a crane rail for an overhead crane, and it's a typical industrial building of the type used for railway workshops and a perfect place to display them. They have done a fair bit of work too on the small exhibits, just like this small display of railway signs. It's got the railway's logos, destination signs, station signs, and they're simply displayed on a structure made out of standard industrial shelving, but it's quite effective and they're varied from time to time. Part of the workshops continues to be used for railway repair work, both for the heritage items and some railway rolling stock. And within limits, visitors can take a path through the workshops. So when work like this is being done, it adds a bit more life to the museum. Staying in Australia now, but moving south to New South Wales, this is the Railway Museum at Thirlmere, which has an operating track of several kilometres. And of course, many of you may recognise the locomotive. It's the, the twin sister to a YDM4, exactly the same Alco diesel, except that it's for standard gauge four foot eight and a half. Um, they were very popular in Australia and I think they were very popular in India too and many other countries. But because the Thirlmere Museum is the closest one to where I live, I don't have many photos of it, probably because we tend to ignore things that are easily accessible and close to us. But I've included a Google Earth picture of the museum in its surrounding town, which will give you an idea of the scale of it. The museum building is the white building running across the centre and above it to the right you can see the turntable area and outdoor area for visitors when they arrive. Most of the exhibits are all housed in covered accommodation which is a good idea 
although some of the operating trains they use on their branch line are stored outside. And at the bottom of the museum towards the left is a quarter roundhouse, which is their workshops for repair and restoration. In the museum is a locomotive that's typical of the very first locomotives to operate in Sydney, and very similar too to the first freight locomotives used by the East India Railway out of Kolkata. They've got a few mannequins uh, spread around the museum, but as you'll see there, they haven't attempted to have very realistic mannequins. They're just anonymous figures without facial details to show you what the role of the person operating it was. Uh, this picture is, the main point here is that the exhibits are all installed on fully engineered railway tracks with properly prepared ballast and sleepers so that they can be moved around and taken out for operation when this is feasible. It does have the drawback though, that if people in the museum are not terribly agile, they have to walk up and down the pathways and it's not always easy for them to walk across the railway track areas. Um, but it's, that's probably a, necess a necessity to enable the museum to uh, access its exhibits. And certainly if they have to access an exhibit that's stored at the very most distant part of the museums, they can spend a full day shunting exhibits in and out to extract the ones they want. And now to uh, one in Europe, one of the best, the Utrecht Museum in the, Utrecht, in the Netherlands. It's the Dutch National Railway Museum. And like many railway museums, it's, uh, it's, it occupies a former railway building. In this case, a very ornate station at Utrecht called Marleban Station, of which this is the exterior as you approach the museum. The station hall is very nicely decorated. It even has a royal waiting room for visiting royalty, which was part of the exhibit. And in this uh, entry area, you can see a, an electric locomotive is parked outside on what was the platform area. The mu museum has been open for ooh, at least 40 or 50 years. And about 10 years ago, it had a fairly major renovation, which greatly expanded its uh, display area and allowed for some new exhibits to be put in. As part of that expansion, a new covered area was put up. And if you look at the building structure here, you'll see it's just a very standard industrial building with a steel trust roof, very basic, but it serves the purpose. But they put this locomotive up on a raised display platform for, if, for better effect. It can be seen from most parts of the museum, and of course, people can walk under it and look at the, uh, the valve gear and pistons. The earlier and more traditional displays are on what was the railway platform. Uh, there's an electric locomotive of uh, some of age shown here. And if you look at the platform structure and the canopy, you can see it's supported by some fairly ornate uh, steel beams and columns. In the general display area, uh, a number of exhibits are seen here, and uh, it's particularly impressive that they have very nicely paved the area around the rail tracks. Most of it's concrete, but here they've put in bricks to represent cobblestone paving, which makes it very easy for people to get around the museum. And if somebody has a stroller or is in a wheelchair, access is very good. Also, a good use has been made of natural lighting. Uh, to ensure that, at least in the summer months, they can cut down on their electricity costs. The Utrecht Museum also had and still has a restaurant, but this one is no longer uh, in operation. This was a former restaurant they had, very nice and ornate and done up to look like a railway refreshment room using a lot of um, heritage furniture. They've now moved it to another one, and this same building has been transformed into a goods shed to display goods handling. And this is the outside of the building. It's quite a, a good setup there with a, a small lorry taking away some uh, freight that's been delivered. And you can go into the goods shed and look at freight handling details. Again, that's more one for the serious enthusiast than the casual member of the public, but it's been done to a high quality. And now to one of my favorite museums, the French National Railway Museum at Mulhouse in Eastern France. This is the approach to the museum. It's called the Cité du Train, 
which doesn't translate literally, but I think you could loosely say train world is what they're saying. The locomotive out the front is unusual because it's not well preserved. It doesn't have its, uh, its pistons and connecting rods. The boiler cladding isn't there, but it is in a good state of, it's, it, it's not derelict. But its purpose is not as a heritage item, it's simply a signpost. It says to you, there's a railway museum here. <laughs> The railway museum was uh, created in the early 70s, but planned much before that. And the first time they opened it was in a temporary location at Malou's in a former locomotive roundhouse. It was only ever intended to be a temporary museum. And as you can see here, it wasn't very well presented. The roundhouse was still very dusty and sooty and the exhibits were just crammed in very closely. So you could see them, but it was far from ideal and it was only to be temporary until the new museum, which was purpose-built, was created. Now, the new museum was in a purpose-built building um, designed solely for this idea, and it wasn't attempting to recreate a railway building. It was simply to be a, a good functional museum. It's got mass concrete walls and a very elaborate laminated timber roof using expensive and architect-designed laminated timber beams. The locomotive you'll see here is one of the star exhibits, and I'll come back to that shortly. The presentation is very realistic, and certainly to look at this locomotive, you'd think it was a live operating steam locomotive. But in fact, it's a model, quite an impressive model. It looks like it's about one third full size, possibly, maybe smaller. But the wheels turn and a quite a realistic steam and smoke effect is given. And behind it, you can see a full-size locomotive for a comparison. But uh, this gives a little bit of life to otherwise static models. In recent years, the French government, which is the owner of this and many other museums, has contracted out the, to private companies the operation and maintenance of the museums. The, gov the government still owns them and it's still responsible, but the operation is contracted to private companies. And in the case of Malou's, this meant that they redesigned a lot of the display areas to give them what they felt was a more attractive presentation. I would call it a theatrical presentation. In the new halls, the exhibits are generally in a fairly dark setting and highlighted with floodlights and coloured lights. And there's a guided walkway where you follow the path to view the exhibits. It's been very successful and the numbers of people visiting the museum has increased but I personally feel I prefer the old style exhibits, but they have some very impressive highlights. In the section dealing with railways and war, they've got a nice exhibit where the locomotive has been derailed and turned on its side. This does get your attention. If you walk up, come up to the locomotive and it's lying in a pile of ballast and the steam oozing out from it, you can't help but be impressed. Now, when they put this exhibit in, they didn't want to damage the locomotive unduly, so they removed the left-hand side smoke deflector from the front of the locomotive, which would in any case be covered in the ballast and dirt. And they also, under the locomotive, packed a large heap of old tractor tyres to give a soft cushioning effect. And once they'd done that, they spread the ballast and the dirt around to make it look like a derailed locomotive. Uh, there's not too many museums, I think, have something like this. In terms of using mannequins, the museum uses those to good effect, certainly in some of the carriages. But if you look carefully, carefully, you'll see they're not lifelike figures. They're almost a bit like an artist's caricature. They have people's facial features, a bit of a sort of um, not, full, not, realistic, not realistically recreated, but it gives an impression in this case of four businessmen sitting in, or three businessmen sitting in, in, a, in a dining car. It's quite successful and a bit of a change from the usual um, department store type figures. The museum used to have a section outdoors, which had some rather interesting exhibits like a small signal box, a typical small railway station and an ornate platform canopy. But I think it has to be admitted these were less interesting to the general public. So when the museum had the um, new administration that I just mentioned came in, these were removed and replaced by the new exhibition hall. I hope they've been preserved somewhere, but I haven't seen them at the museum lately. 
there are some things that museums can show where you could never show the real thing, so they have to make do with reduced versions. And this is a presentation on the locomotive testing facility at Vitry in France, where a steam locomotive could be put on rollers and operated in a stationary position while its power output and operating characteristics were measured scientifically. Uh, what you're looking at, of course, is a very good model, but it does capture all the relevant features of the testing plant. And in terms of refreshments, Milouze, uh, you know, Milouze has a very pleasant cafe restaurant. And if, if one will look beyond the beer glass, you can see that in the background, part of the side of a carriage off one of the Trans-Europe Expresses has been used as the serving area. Quite a nice way of carrying the railway theme into the refreshment area. But returning to the, the 232U1, this was one of the last of a series of experimental locomotives built in France during the steam era. It's a four cylinder compound, but I won't go into any more technical details. But the, the display is animated, so I will pause the slideshow and show a one minute video of this locomotive in operation. And reduce, new share, advanced video. Share. Right. Well, I think that's very impressive. Um, it's an artificial recreation, but it gets the idea across and it's really the next best thing, next best thing to the real thing. But of course, if you want the real thing, you need to go to an actual operating depot. So I thought I'd include a short look at Rewari, even though I don't think it's fair to call it a museum, it's primarily an operating depot, but it has features that a museum can't achieve. Uh, this is just a picture of one of the meter gauge freight locos coming out of the uh, museum or depot for a group of visitors. And that's the sort of atmosphere that a site like Rewari can offer, whereas a traditional museum can never hope to achieve. And it's certainly worth a visit. It does oppose, impose a few extra constraints on visitors because it's not necessarily user friendly. You have to avoid falling into the locomotive pit. But nonetheless, it's very worthwhile. And more to the point, it enables an enthusiast or a visitor to sort of see presentations and images that just can't be matched elsewhere. You know, there's the steam, there's oil, there's heat, all the real things that make a locomotive a live living being. Moving to a different one now, we're going back to Europe and the Polish Museum at Warsaw. It's located in a, a station just outside the main Warsaw station. And most of exhibits, its exhibits are outdoors along tracks either side of a platform. They're in fairly good condition, um, but I think some of them would perhaps not satisfy a railway enthusiast, although they'd be quite satisfactory for the general public. And by way of example, this locomotive looks good, it's in fair condition, but it's missing its pistons, coupling rod, and some of the details. So you can't look at that and say, yes, that's a working locomotive. But there's a lot there to see, and it's good to see that it's been preserved. And again, they've got some unusual features. 
they've got an extremely heavily armoured armoured train, which is seen here. I'm afraid I don't know much about its history, but what you see there is a heavily armoured steam locomotive in the middle with a virtually a tank on rails in front of it and behind it. Again, although the Delhi Museum has a rather interesting armoured train of its own, I don't think it's quite as impressive as this one, perhaps. The Warsaw Museum's got a good internal area with excellent models, photographs and documents. Unfortunately, the day I visited it, it was the day that it closed after lunch. So I only had about a 40 minute visit to have a quick look around, but it was it was time well spent. And now to an, another excellent museum, I'd have to include the NRM at Delhi. And of course, the picture there shows the Northwestern Railway Atlantic that they've got, and which in recent years has been brought back to a very high star, high high quality presentation. But storing exhibits outdoors, displaying them outdoors, has a continuing maintenance task. And this picture taken in, I think, 2003, shows work being done on restoring the Darjeeling railway carriage at the museum. And by restoration, I mean basically building a new body on the frame. And that, that's not a problem because that's what the railways did over the, over the life of most rolling stock anyway. But having restored the carriage to a good condition in 2003, move on about 12 or 13 years, and again, the weather has taken its toll. The bodywork is looking damaged and worn. The paintwork's coming off. Nothing lasts forever. So again, fast forward again a few years, about five years later, and again, it's being restored uh, to you know, give it a new lease of life and very well restored as well. And happily now, it's displayed under some covered shelter, which should keep the worst of the weather away from it. It's seen here behind the nicely presented Darjeeling B-class locomotive. And behind it is the Matheran Railways locomotive and carriages, which have also been done up very well. Uh, the NRM at Delhi has also included a large model railway layout in its display. <clears throat> which I'm a little bit unclear about because essentially it's just a large model railway layout. It doesn't have a lot of relevance perhaps to India or Indian railways, but it does have a purpose for entertaining children who of course will like it. But the rolling stock on it is just typical model railways from Europe, America, wherever. There's nothing that will inform you more about Indian railways. And I suspect the job of keeping the model railway running is a bit challenging because when I visited it last time, it was not working. However, as I say, if it works, it has a value in interesting young children. <sighs> Probably a little better than that is the, the uh, covered exhibits area at the Delhi NRM. It's had a couple of improvements and refreshments, refreshments over the years, but it's always been good. This picture is a few years old, showing, showing some of the displays and models of rolling stock. And models of rolling stock can teach, you, teach us more than we think. This is one of the older and large scale models of a carriage off the Great Indian Peninsula Railway. I think it would date from the early, early 20th century. And while it's a good example of carriage building at the time, if you look carefully at the right-hand side, the doorway there is labeled as being for servants. So some of these models can actually capture some of the social conditions uh, that prevailed at the day. This is another view of the um, covered exhibits area. And I show it because the carriage in the middle distance there, it's quite a large scale model of a four wheel carriage and a very historic one too. And uh, it's the sort of thing that should be well cared for and displayed in the museum. It's uh, a model that was made Oh, about 150 years ago in the workshops of the Awad and Rolokin Railway, and it was sent to Britain for display. I'm not sure where. It may have been at one of the big industrial exhibitions. It stayed in Britain for many years and then returned to India in the 1960s to become part of the museum. But uh, if you have a look inside the model, and as I said, it is a large model, it's uh, got a lot of value in giving a contemporary uh, point of reference for how the carriages were fitted out and decorated at that time. So it's got a great deal of history and is it very worthy of conservation. Now, another question about working models is whether they do in fact work. 
I'm not sure if this model is still on display at Delhi. The picture is taken from one of the earlier guidebooks, and it's a very nice model of Kalar Railway Station, where the rack section starts on the Nilgiri Mountain Railway. It's a large exhibit, 8 metres long by 1.8 metres wide, and the engine is sort of electrically powered and shows how the rack railway engages to climb the hills. Again, <laughs> I've never seen it operating, uh, which is a bit of a pity, and last time I visited the museum, I don't recall seeing it there. So um, I think my point there is that operating exhibits can be good, but provided they do actually operate. And refreshments, always important. I think this is the current um, um, appearance of the, the cafe at the NRM. And very nice it is too. It's got you know rather charming furniture. The windows have been beautifully decorated. It's even got a model train track running around the cafe, and which is a bit unusual. And looking at the train track, I would suspect, but I don't know, but I would suspect the intention was that it should be able to deliver meals around to the various tables. I don't know whether that's true or not, but it would be very interesting. Anyway, it looks very popular, and I think it's a, a feature. I'll just finish with the NRM with some of the work that's been done there. This is the one of the Matherin Railway locomotives, or the, the Matherin Railway locomotive. And over the years, I've seen this at Delhi in very poor condition. But clearly, under the last uh, round of renovations and improvements, it's been given a fully professional restoration and, in, most importantly, correctly displayed in the liveries that it probably operated in. So I rather like that. Probably more typical is the Nilgiri locomotive at Delhi. This is taken a few years ago, but it shows the exhibit in what I would call average condition. That's, that's in fairly good condition for a locomotive that stands out in the weather. It has a few, um, it's, it gets overhauled occasionally and a new paint job. But the thing about the weather is if you look closely, it takes its toll and underneath the locomotive, you can see that the, the boiler cladding is rusting through badly that the gears have got a fair degree of surface rust on them, and it's generally in a, a somewhat bad, you know, it would need a lot of work to put it back in a fully, fully, um, fully representative condition. However, it still exists and it is taken care of. In terms of carriages, again, uh, most of the carriages are not accessible to the visitors and that's necessary to avoid damage. This is, I believe, the interior of the uh, the interior of the Geekwar of Baroda's uh, carriage. It's quite dusty inside, but otherwise in good condition. Uh, that's the outside of the carriage. It's interesting in that the wheel, the axles at either end, were not firmly fastened to the frame. They had some scope for movement, whereas the centre axle is actually fixed. Another interior shot, uh, I think this is the Maharaja of Mysore's carriage, I'm not sure, but it's again a bit shabby inside, but in reasonable condition. Um, certainly better than the one that I showed at the beginning of this talk. Uh, now I'll move to Mysore, Mysore and show some old pictures. These were taken again in about 2001. At that stage, the museum had a rather nice idea. It was using a, the body of a brake fan for the ticket window at the entrance, which I thought was quite a nice reuse of railway equipment and maintained the railway theme. Although I did notice yesterday that it does have, does have a much more impressive entrance building now. But even back in 2002 through 2003, the carriages at Mysore were well preserved under shelter. This is the Maharani of Mysore's carriage. And it was very nice. You could actually go through that, not casually by individual visitors, but under guided tours with someone to show you through. Uh, the interior woodwork is all very nicely polished and preserved. Uh, it appears the Maharani had a four poster bed, which is rather charming and definitely a worthwhile bit of uh, heritage preservation of a historic carriage. Again, something that's changed. When I visited it many years ago, this little narrow gauge locomotive was raised up off the ground and had a power unit to drive the wheels around. But I noticed yesterday in the presentation that touched on Mysore that it's now just displayed on track as a static exhibit. But this was obviously a good idea. Um, it looked as if the wheels could be turned with an electric motor and gearing. 
And I think it's always positive if you can show something in operation, or at least partly. Moving on briefly to Kolkata, the extensive museum there. I won't spend a lot of time here. <laughs> Just to illustrate again here, the displays are all on well-made track, so they're you know reasonably stable. There's good walkways between the exhibits for people to have a look at them. And everything seems to be displayed in a livery that, or a paint job that is indicative of what it really was like when it was in operation. However, there has, uh, they do have one um, good covered area for the major exhibits. And the only comment I'd make is it's very well preserved. But again, it's a little bit of a pity, at least from my point of view, that the paint job is a rather sort of mm, fancy one that doesn't necessarily reflect the way the locomotive would have been in service. Nonetheless, it's it's a good presentation. Mysore is, um, sorry, um, Kolkata. The museum has to be kept tidy. So you've got to have somewhere for people to put their waste and, and, and trash. And children love feeding the penguins. So moving to a... Uh, Another country that features broad gauge, Spain with five foot six. A major museum there is located just south of Barcelona in the former railway depot at a town called Villanova y la Geltru. And it's run by Spanish railways, Renfe. It's not the Spanish National Museum, which is in Madrid, but it's probably more ambitious. It's got a very good turnout of locomotives displayed around the turntable. Some quite interesting technical exhibits. Uh, there's a, a semaphore signal gantry there that was taken from one of the stations in Barcelona when it was superseded. In the background, you'll see one of the original Spanish articulated Talgo trains, which were a, a technical innovation that Spain has developed to a very successful product. They've got their uh, heritage locomotives, of course, and this is one of them. But I'd notice in the background there, the wall behind it shows patterns that have been made by reproducing the casting moulds for locomotive driving wheels, which is just a nice way of carrying the railway theme through the decoration around the museum. And that's a, a portrait of one of the early Talgo trains, which uh, were a big success. Staying on the five foot six gauge, I briefly visit Portugal, where their National Rail Muse Railway Museum is at, is at a town called Entroncamento, which I'm told means junction in Portuguese. Again, it's using a railway depot built around a turntable and roundhouse. The only difference being is that part of the depot is still an operating railway of Portuguese railways. So if you want to go from one side of the museum to the other, you have to go to the crossing and then wait for a staff member to allow you to cross because the tracks are actually in use. The bit that's not in the roundhouse is in part of the old workshop building, which is beautifully clean and well presented there. And as you'll see here, there's some heritage diesels down the left, uh, some vintage carriages along the right, and in the centre, some of the track trolleys for railway workers to take, both pedal-powered and uh, petrol engine. They've got some nice interactive displays here, and these are cost, uh, uniforms that were worn by level crossing keepers. In a lot of railways, level crossings were maintained by women who were either the wives or widows of railway staff, and they'd been given the job to maintain employment and keep the crossings safe. At the museum, they've provided a couple of the uniforms for an adult and a child for a photo opportunity. So you can dress up in these and use the lantern and the flags to sort of, in a small way, participate in the sort of work that was done on the railways. And the last stop is the Budapest Railway Museum in Hungary. It's a major museum and it's operated by the Hungarian Railways, who themselves operate a very major heritage train operation on the mainline tracks. Outdoor exhibits inevitably suffer, of course, and this locomotive, as you can see, it shows the sign of weathering. It's in substantially good condition, but the paint, the paint is peeling off the locomotive. There's some surface rust. It can't be helped and there's a lot to maintain. But what they do have, is live steam. On their operating tracks at weekends and special occasions, they have some very nice heritage locomotives running up and down. This is an old outside framed locomotive, which uh, you can take a cab ride on. And they also have this uh, form, this freight locomotive, which is 
uh, I think of an American design. So I'm finished there and I'll just may draw a few conclusions or make a few comments. Firstly, at the museum site, whether it's uh, to be a purpose-built new building or the use of an existing railway building, clearly using existing railway buildings such as workshops, stations or locomotive depots can give an excellent context to put exhibits in their correct setting. But whether it's indoors or out, whether it's a, a new building or a heritage building, there's always the need sometimes for um, some outdoor display simply because of the number and size of railway exhibits. Indoor display clearly gives the best uh, reduced maintenance and conservation of exhibits, whereas outdoor displays can give better visitor amenities, particularly if the gardens and pathways are well maintained. And uh, as we see at the NRM in Delhi, outdoor exhibits can be maintained in very good condition, but of course it comes at a cost. Ah, one of my subjects, working displays. I think they're important to most exhibit, most museums, um, but the only qualification is that if you set up a working display, the important thing is to make sure it continues to work. And I mean, if a display is shown and it says this model will operate at two o'clock, three o'clock and four o'clock, but people come along and it doesn't operate, or if they come along and it says, you know, out of action, it disappoints them. So somebody who sees that locomotive model on the left operating will come along and say, wow, that's good. Whereas if they come and see a static music exhibit that should be working but isn't, they'll say, well, what does it do? Model railways? I'm a railway modeler myself, so I'm probably being too critical, but I think they have a good role to play. And certainly the one that we were told about in the Japanese museum is a prime example. I show a picture on the left of a model railway in a small museum, railway museum in the town of Bathurst in New South Wales. And what it does is accurately models the railway approaches around the town of Bathurst and the station. And the picture you can see there is of the station master's cottage, which recreates the actual thing. On the right, the one from the Delhi Museum, which will certainly entertain children when it works, but I think it otherwise perhaps doesn't contribute as much as it might to the museum. And now to retailing, very important, shops and souvenirs. I was quite disappointed when the, I found there was no shop at the Italian Railway Museum, and I didn't expect to find one at the Zambia Railway Museum. But I do like buying things in museums, and most people do, so having a shop is important. The selection of souvenirs I've shown in the picture mostly comes from the Delhi Railway Museum, but there's a couple from other places. But if a museum does have a shop, it's important to do the accounting properly to make sure that it's actually operating at a profit. In other words, a museum has to make sure that the cost of making the sales doesn't outweigh the profit that's made. And of course, refreshments. I don't need to say much there. Everybody likes to get a snack or something to eat at the museum, whether it's a modern restaurant or simply a cafe or in heritage style. And I've always found that I could get something to eat that I enjoyed at the museum in Delhi. So that just about finishes it up. I might uh, close the share screen and take any pictures that, any pictures, what am I saying? Any questions that are coming? Thank you. Thank you very much, Warren. Uh, I found in the chat box there are no specific questions, but there are a very large number of comments, all positive. In fact, positive is a very mild word. They are <laughs> extremely positive. I mean, if I start going through them, our time will be over and so I will not go through them all, but I can say that absolute confidence that all the uh, comments regarding the presentation have been extremely positive. Oh, thank you very much. And I did take a bit longer than I should have. <laughs> I, I would like to ask you a question. See, uh, I found especially in places like the UK, a lot of the museum and heritage railways are run by volunteers. What can we do in India to attract volunteers? Uh, well, I think you probably have to change people's understanding of the relationship of individuals to railway companies. Now, the same thing happened in Australia, you know, before, let's, let's say in the 1950s and 60s, the, rail, the only people who could work on railways were staff. If you went off the end of the platform, hey, come back, you shouldn't be there. So there was a feeling that individuals who were not part of the railway had no role there. That took a, quite a while to overcome and change. 
and progressively the um the developed muse museums found that you know they needed to do more than could be done with paid staff and a lot of people particularly those who like railways and those who either had part-time jobs or were retiring you know showed their interest so i don't think there's a quick or magic formula other than to simply show that it is possible and that it can be done um the certain, and certainly you have to be careful of the fact that railway employees don't see the use of volunteer labour as in any way threatening their activities. That's a very potentially serious issue. Yeah, um, and that's still an issue in Australia to some extent. The, the line of activity is uh, important. In other areas, you know, volunteering, well, that's I won't make any more comment on that. I think simply show that it is possible and, you know, that comes little by little. Um there's been a little bit of, I won't say volunteer work, but non-railway contribution to the Darjeeling Railway in terms of advice and resources, but not physical work. So there's no magic answer. Just keep working on it and it will happen. One comment, just come in. I think it's worth repeating. Mr. Raghunandan says that on the strength of your presentation, which was so good, he may start supporting the Australian cricket team. Oh, that's very nice of you. I'm not sure they deserve it. <laughs> anyway, uh, one thought which I had, see, almost any museum you go to, the steam locomotive is the main exhibit. It's the main attraction. It is the, uh, take, has prime of uh, the main, main place. Logically, because uh, it's a steam locomotive that launched the railways. But anyway, uh, can you think of any museum where the steam locomotive is, has, doesn't have the prime uh, place. Oh, no, I would, I don't, I haven't visited it. So I would, not, I, I think the Japanese Railway Museum gives strong emphasis to modern technology and high speed and electrical. But beyond that, no, I think the steam locomotive, if for not for heritage, at least for nostalgia, always has first place. But certainly modern technology is, uh, is moving ahead and will increasingly take its share of the museum area. Anyway, uh, thank you very much, Boris. It was indeed an extremely good presentation and it took us to uh, museums all over the world. Thank you. Uh, have you visited any museum in uh, North America? Um, a couple of, not many, but and I didn't include those because I think they'd be- Because you didn't include them, that's why I'm asking. Sorry? Yes, no, I, years ago, I did go to the museum in Montreal, which is now Expo Rail, but that was very different to what it's now become. Neva hey, Warren, thank you very much. We will rely on you again next year for our next uh, conference. I'm sure you'll be able to get us, no, I'm sure you can talk on any subject which concerns the railways, but uh, I'm sure you'll be able to help us again next year. Thank you very much.